All right, if you're ready. Then yeah, I am yeah. too. Okay, good. Um, so, yeah, I'm uh, Kim Hendricks. I'm, um, uh, how do you call that, research associate for the FNRS. And uh, I'm based at, at the University of Yash in a research group called Spiral. Um, and this is a, uh, we're in, within the faculty of law and political science, but we're a um, multidisciplinary group composed of uh, <coughs> mainly political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, uh, a couple of philosophers as well. And um, we work on, a, an, on, <clears throat> on everything that connects science, technology and society. So STS as such is, a, is a, um, one of our research axes and is what probably unites all of us. And there are some more specialized orientations like uh, risks, for example, um, risk society. Um, qualitative methodologies, policy evaluation, and also the um, the access research access, uh, ecology and society. So that, that those are broadly the themes that we that we work on. Um, <clears throat> so our research, and I think I can say that for the the whole group, we're about 20, 25 persons, and uh, is empirically informed. So we do all all of us do empirical research um, with a variety of qualitative methods. Um, but of course, empirical research also combines with uh, conceptual work that is proper to STS as a, as a discipline. Um, and some of us also use uh, more philosophical concepts and, and so on. So um, that is the, um, the, the, the the research group that I that I am a part of, and uh, oh yeah, let me just say that I'm with um, uh, a couple of other colleagues. We're also on the steering committee of the BSTS network, so the Belgian Science, Technology, and Society network. And um, <clears throat> since COVID, there there hasn't happened a lot within the network, and so we're relaunching it now. And so first meeting is scheduled. This was sent on the BSTS list, mailing list, uh, yesterday, I think, by my colleague uh, Pierre Delvin. Um, so we're meeting, we're organizing and hosting a meeting in Liège on the 3rd of July. It's on a Monday, uh, right before the most people will probably take off uh, for holidays. Um, and so the idea is to yeah, organize a, a get together of people who already know each other, but also when we encourage you to invite and spread the word. Uh, also, um, you know, junior researchers and, and uh, other people that we haven't met yet too. Because there are a lot of people in in Belgium, in the two parts of the country, <coughs> on, uh, science and technology topics. Even though STS, as such, is not really institutionalized in Belgium yet. Um, so yeah, so the BSTS network is one way of getting those people to talk together and. Um, so this will be an entire day uh, with two parts. We're still fine-tuning the program. We'll send around uh, the program and probably with a, uh, a link to, um, to uh, um, register for the conference so that we have an idea of how many people to expect. And this will happen in the city centre in La Grande Poste, which is a renovated uh, thinking, creative space. It's a bit of... Yeah, just Silicon Valley, <laughs> in, in a way. They call their they call their auditoria and their uh, meeting rooms incubators and things like that. So you know, it should be. <laughs> the, the beer's not bad. Though, so that's a <laughs> yes, and there are, there is. Yeah, yeah, that's included in the program. There's a, a beer part in the program. Too, so okay. <clears throat> All right, so now i uh, just give you some, some background um, about this particular talk because I'll have to say just a, a couple of words about my previous research because I'm going to attempt to, you know, uh, knit together some of the, my, my previous research strands and try to um, uh, render visible an, an undercurrent that's been uh, working in, in, in my previous research. Um, and one way of, 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 <coughs> of summarizing that is that I've always been interested in the, the, the body 
as a, a site of interpretation, also as a site of demonstration, um, as something that's mobilized in evidence basis. And my my first research in this broad thematic is uh, what was my PhD dissertation on the demonstration of uh, food-related health claims. So how do you prove that this or that food or food component is good for you? And um, it's actually quite a complex issue because we, as soon as you um, look into the um, the methods for demonstrating this, then the f this whole food business uh, starts interfering with uh, medicine and drugs and the way that drugs are tested and um, the way that your human bodies are actually mobilized to provide uh, proof of efficacy. And so um, here the, the body be is not only a, uh, let's say a site where we try to inscribe and detect markers to see that something that the body reacts to something. It also becomes a site of where we make political differences between two markets, that of food and that of drugs. And so um, uh, that was the, like the, the first uh, <coughs> research where I really got interested in this, the body as a site of markers of signs. Um, and how they are mobilized. Um, another research trend is epigenetics and um, where we also detect markers and try to understand their significance in terms of transgenerational transmission of certain um, of certain biochemical states really. Um, and then the, my, my most recent research project is on human biomonitoring, where the human body, well, not only the, the human body, because there are, we also mobilize plants and animals as um, indicators of environmental pollution. And so the empirical question behind that is, how does that work? How do, do we do that? Um, how do we choose which kind of toxics, toxic chemicals we're going to uh, monitor? Um, and what do we do with the results? Um, and <clears throat> in all of these, there is a common, there is a, a, a tension common to these 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 three um, research uh, strands that I just outlined. Every time I come across this tension between the the, the facts that are made to exist through these uh, intricate apparatuses of of proof or dispositif. Um, so attention between the facts that are made to exist on the one hand and <clears throat> the ways in which they are made to matter on the other hand. Um, for example, in, in biomonitoring, the detection of toxic chemicals in the body points to a history, uh, a geographical distribution <coughs> of, of chemicals, a political economy uh, that released all these chemicals and put them in circulation in ways that we're trying to understand now. Um, but most of the time, the interpretation of biomonitoring results is governed by uh, thresholds. Thresholds that tell us, okay, above this level, um, we can expect health risks or even acute effects of toxicity. And below the threshold, supposedly everything would be okay. That's the, the, the way in which this is often mobilized in the end. Um, in the media, but also in when when uh, politicians need to take certain me measures. Um, in epigenetics, evidence that a certain epigenetic status uh, or biochemical signature, if you like, um, changes the way a cell is going to function. And if that uh, function or dysfunctioning is passed on to the next generation, then immediately. You can, uh, this quickly opens debates about par parental responsibility for health, for the health of your children, for example. I will give an, an example later on, on a, of a specific uh, epigenetic mark, uh, an, uh, a methylation that's passed from uh, fathers to their children. And then uh, a, de a debate uh, is, um, then the, the debate starts about okay, are these fathers responsible for their uh, for um, their children's future health status because the epigenetic mark is related to a, a health risk. Um, 
And I sort of wonder, well, shouldn't we be asking how this might change our conception of kinship, for example, or individuality of what a risk is, of what a disease is, rather than immediately jumping to the great ethical questions of responsibility, who's responsible, and, and so on. So in all these examples, there's a relation of, of disproportion between the, the apparatuses that make it possible of calling into existence new facts that are interesting and that say something about the real, um, that allow us to create new and multiple points of articulation with the real, if you like. And on the other hand, the, the moral and political categories <coughs> we, we, we mobilize to, to think these results and these practices. Um, and by consequence, what often happens is that um, the, the scientific findings we have, we mobilize them as data or evidence, reduce them to the status of data or, or evidence for some, for some other question, in the service, for example, of, say, policy making. So <clears throat> my question is, aren't we closing down, in many cases, the, the possible interpretations or speculations too quickly? Should we slow down? Uh, and then, this might be a strange question because uh, it's, we're living in times of urgency where we need to act um, immediately on what's uh, happening in terms of uh, the environment, in terms of toxicity, uh, and so on. And <coughs> we, we <coughs> think that data and evidence on pollution, for example, are important. So it's not against this, uh, these data are, that, I, that, that I will be arguing, not at all, but <clears throat> the thing is maybe we should slow down and slowing down is, uh, might uh, help us accelerate later on uh, where we don't expect it, for example. Um, <clears throat> one possible metaphor for this is that is going on a hike, for example, you want to get to, from point A to B. Um, slowing down might make you attentive to certain shortcuts or, or on the other hand um, um, might make you realize that point B is perhaps not worth going to after all that there's another direction which is mu much more interesting so it's just a, <clears throat> a metaphor it's a bit of a clumsy metaphor but it sort of gives you a, a, a taste of what I want to uh, get at okay so <clears throat> This is the, the sort of, uh, these are the sort of thoughts that I wanted to pack into this slogan, keep biology weird, and then, you know, why a slogan? Do, do we need a slogan for this? Um, not necessarily, but I think it's, uh, for me, it works as a sort of call to attention. And um, I did get some inspiration from, from the US when I was in the US because uh, they like slogans there and stickers a t-shirt with these kind of things on and um, one of those, so I'll give you some examples now, uh, you know, keep Austin weird, keep Portland weird, keep Santa Cruz weird. Uh, apparently it started in Austin and all these uh, variations on the same theme initially uh, were meant to support local businesses uh, and to maintain sort of diversity in local shops and um, but it, it extends to this thought of um, you know, encouraging artistic communities and diversity and inclusion and uh, against gentrification, really. So it's a call to keep alive and promote all these uh, kind of things that go under this, this term weirdness, uh, keep it weird. <clears throat> now, as it turns out, weird is actually quite an interesting term. Um, it comes with associations that I'm that I think might enrich the basic problem that I, that I sketched earlier. Um, namely, where are we going to take these multiple indexes, signatures, traces, symptoms that we um, mobilize the biological and for the life sciences for to understand bigger issues about our environment, where are we going to take these traces? And it's the, the, the etymology of the, of the word weird, which is really interesting. From, it's an old Germanic or old English word, uh, weird, written with a, with a Y, um, which <coughs> is related to this, this um, idea of destiny, of fate, and the control or the failure to control destiny. Yeah. In, in this slide, I chose to, I opted for the word lure, because uh, in 
you know, a lot of stories and mythologies, the ideas that uh, people uh, or kings, for example, are lure lured into this, this idea that they can know the future and then act to realize that future, but acting on this prophesied future act actually alters the way that things are going to happen. So the, the, the lure of this control. Um, Shakespeare's play Macbeth um, refers famously to the, the Weird Sisters, which are also referred to as the three witches or the three fates. So this is the sort of um, you know cloud of connotations <coughs> of associations that the word weird invokes, and uh, I'll try to um, you know uh, put these as multiple associations to work in what I'm going to talk about in terms of field work that I did. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the first, so here's an overview of uh, the, the sort of the, the three parts of the of, of my talk today. The first, in the first part, I will be talking about the lab and how we work with uh, model organisms. And then I'll make a stopover in, uh, in literature, and more specific in weird fiction and all the new forms of, of, of weird fiction. And I'll ask how this, how this might uh, help us to think with this concept of, of the weird. The weird as a mode of attention, that's the final uh, suggestion that I will make. Um, is this an interesting uh, way of, of, of thinking to be a mode of attention that we, that we need, especially now? So in the lab with model organisms, <clears throat> now I um, I mentioned the bumper stickers and the t-shirts and the, um, but this wasn't the the, the, the first time that the, um, the the word weird really came to my attention. The, the first time really was in the lab when I was working with molecular biologists. So I spent a couple of months uh, working with a molecular biologist at the university of Santa Cruz, so in, in, in California, and so the the whole thing made sense because they said that things were weird, and then you had the stickers keep Santa Cruz weird, and so there was this, this thing going on with uh, with that caught me thinking about, uh, made me think about this 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 weird, and um, <clears throat> um, this happened to be a really interesting place to be, not only for the uh, because there's a um, um, a leading lab working with a model organism C. elegans that I will uh, show you uh, in a couple of minutes. But it's also a great intellectual com community to be with um, a lot of uh, thinkers that have in, and, and anthropologists and empirical works that have informed my work, like uh, Anna Sink, for example, is based there, uh, Donna Haraway, Jenny Reardon, who, um, who uh, hosted me there who did a lot of interesting work on um, genomics and post-genomics. Uh, one of her books is The Post-Genomic Condition. And the question, so, you know, we've sequenced the human genome, and now the big question is, what, what do we all do? We have all, we have all these data, but what do they mean? Are we going to mobilize this data? What, what, what do they mean? And uh, it's a um, uh, really interesting uh, work, and I think it sort of connects to what I'm saying here today. And so <clears throat> there's a leading lab on the C. elegans research, and that was particularly interesting for me because I was working on epigenetics uh, at that time. And my initial question was, okay, in a lab with model organisms, maybe I'll be sort of liberated from all the uh, moral and political discussions on responsibility uh, within, within a human community. Here, people are working with tiny little worms, and so it will be really be interesting to see how they um, mobilize or make sense of this, this um, of epigenetics and especially the, the concepts of body and environment, because epigenetics sort of blurs this distinction, um, because you know phenotypic changes can occur and occasionally be, be passed on without any change in the, the, the DNA molecule as such. So what we're talking about here is differences in signaling, um, biochemical differences, 
that somehow are transmitted and um, that are sensitive to what happens in, in the environment. But the environment is a bit of a vague notion, so what is the environment? For uh, cell biologists, the cell itself is already an environment for the, the DNA and the histones and the, all these units that they work with within the cell. But of course, there's a, the broader notion of the environment as well, uh, the human body as such, and then the environment of the human body. So I want to know, you know, how, how do they work with this? Do they operationalize this distinction in some way? Or And <clears throat> the question uh, that I was asking quickly retreated into the background because they weren't asking these questions at all. Um, now, this doesn't mean that the questions aren't worth asking, but it sort of reorient, reoriented my, uh, my own uh, interest at, at that time because I thought, okay, if they are not working with this, then what is it that they're concerned about? What, what is it that they're interested in? And <clears throat> what they're interested in is the worm itself. Um, so let me just sketch a very, very brief history of this, this particular model organism. It was um, isolated from its natural habitat. At some point, it has to be isolated from somewhere. It, it has to come from somewhere. And that this happened in the 1970s. Um, there are different strains now uh, that are used in, lab, in labs. One's from uh, Hawaii, for example, but the, the one that they were working with, and I think this was <coughs> historically the first one that was isolated from the environment, was in Bristol, England. So it's called the Bristol N2 strain, um, which is a worm um, that is used and reproduced, and uh, everything is being done to, get it, to keep its genome stable, to make research findings comparable uh, across different labs, but also within one lab, uh, because what they do is create all sorts of mutations um, in order to learn about the mechanics, uh, the molecular mechanics of what these changes do, what is responsible for, which mechanism, biological mechanism is uh, responsible for a specific kind of change. So they need, uh, apart from all the mutants that they create, they also need a stable reference uh, reference genome, and this is the, you know, the originally the, the Bristol worm that they uh, are working with. And <clears throat> so this worm was isolated, and uh, um, in the, the history books, it's Sidney Brenner, who is a biologist, Amer uh, American British, but he's um, um, the one who had a vision um, and a reason to isolate this particular worm because you could ask so why why this worm why not some other organism because there are there are other organisms in use as well zebra fish or uh, fruit flies uh, different kinds of model organisms and the population of model organisms is also expanding they're using different uh, sorts of uh, model organisms now um, so why why this one um, and this has to do with a number of interesting physiological properties of the worm. It's, it's small, so it's easy to, to store. It doesn't take a lot of space. It uh, has a rapid reproduct reproductive cycle, which is important if your basic method is to um, induce mutations and then compare them to, um, to non-mutated worms or to, to different kinds of um, genetic makeups. So it has a rep reproductive cycle, which allows experimenting with uh, the, the DNA or with epigenetic changes. They're easy to feed. Uh, they feed on a bacterium, Escheria coli. Uh, they can be frozen and kept, and uh, the worm and different mutants and variants of them are really kept in freezers, and they call these worm libraries. And um, it's small size also allows uh, mapping the whole organism and that was a, the, one of the main reasons that Brenner wanted to use this worm because <coughs> a whole organism hadn't been, or a whole genome hadn't been sequenced up to then. So the worm is you know, one of the first uh, animals that had its entire genome sequenced and along with this was this whole idea that we're we need to, biology needed to 
transform its questions and work and, and its methods and work on entire organisms and produce a lot of data. So the worm was selected for its relative genetic simplicity uh, and also the fact that um, its entire neural network uh, could be mapped. And they did so where they have the worm's connectome, they have its genome. Um, and finally, and last but not least, the worm is also physiologically transparent, so we can actually see through it and under a microscope observe what happens in its body. So all these uh, physiological properties are actually of a um, logistically interesting, so it's a logistic project really, and it favors a specific type of science or, or, uh, or knowledge. And <clears throat> the, the idea that was already looming on the horizon at that time was the Human Genome Project. Um, the idea was if we can test this on a worm, if we can sequence the, the, the DNA of a whole organism, and if our way of doing that works, then we can uh, scale this project up, and at some point we'll be able to map the genome of the human being. And this is a, um, it's a bit, the image is a bit blurry, uh, but it's one of the first logos of the Human Genome Project. And, you know, the, 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 it, it, it represents, it symbolizes pretty well uh, the extent to which um, this project is a really an infrastructural thing. It's um, knowledge, uh, science as an, as an infrastructure uh, or a new infrastructure to, for a new kind of, of science um, because the, the computers are there uh, the idea that we need to assemble a lot of data and this is a, without, without me, without knowing what the biological significance of it is in advance so it's a, it's a, it's a new way of, of it was a new way of uh, approaching biological questions and Brenner uh, was uh, one, of, one of the citations of Brenner is that he, he said that, you know, at the time that, that they were selecting the worm and uh, starting to work on these new questions was that he, he was of the, of the opinion that nearly all the classical problems, so I'm, I'm quoting here, nearly all the classical problems of molecular biology have either been solved or will be solved in the next decade so the future of molecular biology lies in the extension of research to other areas of biology, notably development and the nervous system. So the worm, in a sense, embodied, literally, um, the, the, um, the logistic requirements of a particular type of science or knowledge. And the worm itself is could be considered in that sense as an infrastructure for research. So uh, we call it a model organism. And if you ask the biologist to work with the worm, what is it a model of, then they're never really certain what is a model of. But what, one thing is certain that it's a model of this new kind of uh, science. And at least that, that was the case in the 70s, 80s, 90s. But since, um, so we have the human genome, now we have all the data. Like I said, the biological significance of all these data is far from clear. Um, but uh, the, the worm is still being used as a model organism. It wasn't just, um, say, a pretext to, to, to bigger pro for bigger projects to, to come. Um, there, was, there have been some unexpected twists in the fate of the worm. Uh, epigenetics is one of them. But the thing is, and that's the main thing that I uh, took home from this, this uh, research collaboration there, was that the, uh, um, the scientists there will keep on being surprised. The worm doesn't stop surprising the people who work with it. And so the, the organism is a, uh, a topic of interest in itself. It's not necessarily a model for other things so now what is important also is that there's a lot of work that goes into domesticating uh, what you could call domesticating the the, the worm 
so in that sense, uh, model organism is also a, an organism that behaves properly according to what we need in the lab. And to that effect, in, in interventions such as bleaching <coughs> are used, which means that uh, the gut uh, of the worm, which is full of uh, microbes of all sorts, are actually washed out uh, chemically. So there is no interference <coughs> of these microbiotic, unruly kind of uh, interactions. <coughs> Uh, it's a way also of keeping the genome stable. The food itself, so the, 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 um, the bacterium on the, on the Petri dish, is itself standardized as well. And like I said, all this is necessary for their classification. We're keeping track of the worm and its mutations, its versions, if you like, so these worm libraries. <coughs> and today they focus on uh, epigenetic questions. Um, so. Yeah, this is a, a title, just, just an illustration, uh, because the, uh, the transparency of the worm also becomes, became a way of, of, of seeing uh, biology. We have a sort of transparent window onto biology, as if the worm is a sort of passive interface between the question and the answer of the... Whereas, like I just said, the, the worm itself is, needs to be worked on constantly, it needs to be fabricated, it needs to be kept stable. And that's important because the worm, uh, to, I insist on this because, in fact, the worm doesn't stay stable despite all the efforts put into keeping it stable. Over the years <coughs> that uh, the worm has been used, has been put to use in, the, uh, in research labs, its genome did uh, mutate. We don't know precisely how or why, but it's uh, an effect of perhaps of the, domic the domestication efforts themselves. So this is where uh, something uh, unruly, unexpected, something that shouldn't happen, happens within uh, apparatus or dispositive to keep everything stable. And that is an interesting um, uh, issue that I want to you know, insist upon here. So this is what they look like under a microscope. So they're about a millimeter or, or less. Uh, maximum one millimeter long. This is a close-up um, with a powerful microscope and you can actually see the texture and uh, the internal uh, organs here. <coughs> and this is a particular technique which um, where markers that um, are related to uh, neurons light up in, in uh, under the uh, blue part of the UV spectrum. So specific microscopes are used here and these um, GFP reporters, as they called, they light up and so they signal that there's um, um, neurons or uh, it, it, it sort of vis it allows to visualize the, the nervous system uh, of the worm. And this uh, so-called GFP uh, reporter, so GFP is uh, green fluorescent protein, is a thing, uh, a protein extracted from jellyfish originally and inserted as a transgene into organisms to, uh, to have this <coughs> particular function to, to make this visible. And so the worm does have a brain or something equivalent to what we I call a brain as neurons. Um, the dorsal and ventral cord here are also um, uh, neurons. And so it's a, a nervous system, really. Now, <clears throat> I want to say a couple of words about this particular uh, specimen. Uh, this is a, a, a photo that was... Uh, that one of the researchers that I worked with, and I'll, I'll refer to her work properly a bit later in the presentation, um, she shared this, this photograph with me while she was doing research on, on this particular uh, worm and, and a whole set of worms who had similar properties. Now, this, this worm is actually lacking uh, an, an enzyme that represses represses expressions other than germ cell development. So <clears throat> what the biologist told me is that um, the fate of a cell 
So the future development of the cell is in a way protected by this biochemical coding in the form of enzymes, proteins, protein complexes, and so, and so on and so forth. And this is one of the big you know, uh, mysteries in, 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 in biology. How does a cell know what it has to become later on? And so this is part of this answer. Um, certain uh, enzymes <coughs> trigger the cell to become something. There are germ cells that remain germ cells for reproduction and somatic cells that specialize into organs and all sorts of uh, functions for the body. So <clears throat> in this particular room, the protection of the, the fate, as they call it, which is again an interesting term if you, uh, in view of the word weird, the etymology of the word weird, the fate of the germ cells here, the, the, the protection of this fate is rendered inactive. Those, the, the specific cells in this worm were supposed to become germ cells, but in principle, they, become, they can become anything now. And this was present in the, the father uh, of, of the worm. And it has been, it's an epigenetic uh, condition that's been passed on to its offspring. And this is the offspring. So to put it the same thing diff differently in a different manner is that a memory of non-repression has been passed on from, and this is you know, the, the, the words they use, from father to child. Um, and this specimen here is of particular interest. Because there are um, um, places that light up in green that shouldn't be green. Uh, if I go back here, this is what you know, a normal worm, or more or less normal worm, should, should look like, but there shouldn't be green in the places here where <coughs> green. And <clears throat> when I discussed this with her, I sort of made a joke, said, okay, this, this, this worm has gone mental. And that's exactly what's happening. He's trying to develop neurons instead of germ cells. Where germ cells should have been developing, he's trying to develop neurons. So this is a finding and a new problem within the finding. That uh, so a memory of a specific regulator, epigenetic regulator, is passed on, and the worm has become sterile because it doesn't develop germ cells. But some cells go down another pathway now, and so one of the current mysteries, uh, riddles in biology, is that one of the preferred pathways seem to be neurons. Don't know why, but that seems to be the first option. <laughs> and that's what these green areas are all about. So the, the fact that the worm lights up under the blue part of the light spectrum shows or indicates that a neuronal, er, neuronal marker is being expressed. In addition, there are some, also, some other indications as well. The density of some of the green areas they likely indicate that cell membranes are developing and that is something that germ cells in these worms don't have. And a third indicator is what seems to be the development of exodendritic structures. So these connecting threads between neurons. And uh, this photo is from the, the publication that came out on her research uh, two or three years later after after I was there um, it's a close-up of a very similar kind of image as this one and the red arrows point to these thread-like uh, structures these exodendritic uh, structures so <clears throat> let me return to the word weird because that's what I uh, started from now, why might this term be relevant here Apart from the fact that, biology, that the biologists, uh, from time to time, use this word. First of all, um, the context in which the word is, was, was used is, is actually interesting because I have the impression that it was never used to point out the obvious weird, say, the eccentric sides of biology sometimes, you know, like the strange deep sea creatures with ugly teeth and a lot of appendages. Um, it seemed to indicate more or less that uh, 
something happened that shouldn't have happened. So it doesn't either, it doesn't point to a situation where um, a parameter is simply unknown. It doesn't, you know, denote the unknown or something that we don't know yet. That's not weird. It's just something we don't know yet, but we have all the, the means to discover it and the methods and so forth. Uh, weird seems to point to a situation where something unexpected happens or something that wasn't supposed to happen considering the normal rules of development. So it's not a, say, an epistemological, just an epistemological question of we don't know this, this is strange. It's a really, a, it denotes what I would call an ontological event. It's not just that we don't know something, but the, 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 the critter here, the, the organism, did something that maybe was a surprise for, for, <coughs> it, for itself as well. And so in this use, something of the etymology of the word again, of, uh, r related to fate and destiny, <coughs> resonates. Something wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. A twist of fate. <coughs> now, this twist of fate has consequences. And uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, this, this twist of fate is occurs exactly within the infrastructure of normalization and standardization which was no, to guarantee a stable course of you know events as if we could control the entire uh, destiny of the world by controlling its genome <clears throat> now at the same time the standardization work is precisely the sort of milieu where the that allows this weirdness to come to the fore where we can actually see it and work with it. Um, in that sense, the black parts of these pictures, as always black parts, are, uh, are interesting because that also shows all the work that needs to be done to keep all kind of all the things <coughs> out of the picture. So it's again, this, um, it's not only about visualizing things, it's also about keeping other things out that might come to interfere. And like I said, the, over the course of time, the genome of the worm has mutated, has changed. And this makes the worm a sort of a nearly invisible, but in many ways an impressive provocation to the idea of control. Uh, control of some kind of uh, fate. And this wasn't what we expected either, I think, when the worm was isolated from its environment. It was a sort of test bed to... Uh, start testing methods of sequencing and mapping and visualizing whole things and the idea also very much present in the human genome project that if we have the sequence and we uh, have deciphered it we know it and there's a lot of uh, you know l uh, metaphors that relate to writing and reading in the human genome project if you can read the code code itself being another metaphor for biochemistry. If you can read it, then we'll understand it. And if there are errors in the syntax or in the sentences, we just need to correct them. And then we'll have... So that's a, another way of approaching uh, disease and health. It's a uh, disease as a, as a misspelling. So... Um, <clears throat> But the Human Genome Project, you know, the, the sequence was uh, published in the 1990s and ever since people haven't stopped working with this, this, uh, this worm, that's the interesting thing. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of new questions uh, being asked now. Now, <clears throat> so there's a tension, an interesting tension between c control on the one hand and unruly manifestations on the other, or between the normal and the abnormal. And the monstrous and this tension between normal and abnormal happens to be at the heart of a specific genre in fantastic literature as well, uh, which is so-called weird literature. And I, I would propose to look briefly into this um, because I think there are a couple of things that can, you know, further enrich this this conception of of weird and what it might mean today. <coughs> Um, the first kind of fantastic literature re referred to as weird 
uh, was in the late 19th, early 20th century. And more recently, uh, there's a host of authors that are very much inspired by this, what we now call the old weird, and uh, which we can group into the new weird. New, new weird is a sort of more or less official uh, category. Uh, of course, the, the they're just you know um, markers themselves. They're just ways to try and, and group things together and have some common resemblances. There's no, there's no absolute uh, definition of what the old or the new weird is or should be, unfortunately. But the thing is that um, uh, a contrast that I will quickly try to draw between this old and new weird is actually interesting because it's here that we this reflects a history. Uh, it reflects two positions, if you like, the old and the new weird, uh, two positions toward the abnormal or the monstrous, and also how the monstrous is the shadow image of what we think of as what should be the norm or the normal. It reflects a history of positions of deep-seated moral and political uh, attitudes. So this literature, I think, allows exploring the shaping of you know, effective political stances towards unknown, uncharted territories and human control. Or to put it differently, I think it articulates different uh, modes of relating to this unknown, to this, to this weirdness and different declinations of the unknown itself. And it puts forward the question whether and how we can address uh, this unknown. Now, this, these, these attitudes don't, don't just spring from the minds of, of the writers only. The writers are also writing in their time, in their context. So there is some, uh, there are some, some interesting political elements, I think, that uh, will help to, to get a, uh, to, to drop this confidence. <coughs> so, <coughs> a common characteristic, whether it's old or new, is that um, it does deal with the monstrous and the tension with the, you know, between normal and abnormal, so it deals with the monstrous, it deals with horror, in a sense. Uh, but the horror here doesn't reside in the tropes of common tropes of vampires or werewolves or zombies because you know we're sort of familiar with them and in within the literature itself and within the whole within the whole mythology and imagery around it we also know how sort of know how to deal with them should we you know encounter them we know about the full moon the silver bullets and the wooden stakes and things like that so there we have sort of uh, kind of references on how to address them or not address them and relate to them. But weird tales are really, um, this is not the case in, 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 in weird literature. The weird is <coughs> really weird and so we don't get a grasp of what it is we're dealing with. And this, this uh, not knowing has two different uh, qualities, if you like, in the old and the new weird. So the old weirds, uh, you might know this, this author, um, Howard Phillips uh, Lovecraft, the best known uh, author of uh, weird tales. So, <clears throat> so we're talking late 19th, early 20th century here. And uh, in Lovecraft, for example, the stories he tells are really forays into the unknown and they're often narrated as well as gradual... Uh, discoveries or ex expeditions are we find the remnants or documents of a lost expedition uh, we find the diary of a captain of a, on, a, on a sailing boat for example um, telling us what happened that night for example that night late December whatever so these weird tales are about you know terrifying in, in Lovecraft especially terrifying uh, encounters with uh, something unspecified <coughs> and the fact that it's unspecified makes it even more horrifying and what Lovecraft really insists on is that the something this unspecified has we have we don't have a name for it and it's even it's ungraspable by reason so no connection is possible really between 
uh, or between humans and that which is you know, encountered. The encounter can only result in death or madness. Those are roughly the two options that he offers in, in, in these stories. So the monstrous is really radicalized. And <clears throat> uh, the, the interesting thing is that um, this radicalization of the, the monstrous really points to a relation between the monstrous on the, on the one hand and the failure of reason or control uh, on the other. Uh, in the encounters that he describes, the you know humans that are looking drawn to something and there's some kind of strange encounter and usually this this goes through the negation of sort of everything that we might call rational so they encounter impossible geometries um, uh, and it's th th there's a sort of you know cosmic horror and that's the name uh, that Lovecraft gives to this sort of uh, uh, the horror that he tries to, you know, call into existence. And he has a uh, Lovecraft had a, had a theorized his own writing as well, and he was of the the opinion that you know fear is one of the most deep seated uh, emotions in the human species. And so um, he tried to <coughs> tap into the most, this most uh, um, fundamental types of fear that we all might have, which he considered as, you know, universal. So, and this is um, that's his, his theory of, of, of horror. But if you look closer, um, then, and especially in, in contrast to the, the new weird. Um, then you might ask the question whether this horror is really universal or if it's because you know horror is really the, the, the negation of the orders that we value that the society values and um, the, the, the common thread in, in Lovecraft's, Lovecraft's, Lovecraft's sorry, uh, type of horror is the annihilation of reason itself. Uh, re the, 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 you know, the characters in the stories, once they're confronted with the ultimate, the, the ultimate terror sort of active blackness, as it is described often, uh, something tentacular, but the description don't go much further. But it also it always involves some some kind of um, not passive not the <coughs> not the absence of light but some sort of active darkness uh, intruding into the world something tentacular and the merely seeing it is what drives people mad so no one and they usually die uh, a bit later on for causes that are unknown so it's the the negation of reason itself and. <clears throat> we need this background to understand the new weird because in the new weird the, the unknown, the uncanny they no longer signal the, a limit to the possibility of human reason and existence it is uh, not a limit to what we can bear in contrast to uh, the stories by, uh, by Lovecraft so the encounter with something other a radical other is not, it's not radicalized it seems to be a possibility of uh, interaction of some sort. Yeah, these are just some some uh, illustrations that uh, artists have made on the basis of Lovecraft's uh, stories, and you know you can clearly see this, this people, individuals turning into a sort of frightened uh, mass of unreason and and. Uh, and madness <coughs> in the face of something which is really very much unspecified but which does have tentacles this is another artist impression of the kind of you know absolute uh, sort of terror that uh, Lovecraft invokes in his stories and it makes for very good reading I mean he's a great writer the stories are really uh, great to read 
Um, but it, I think it's worthwhile to put Colin to question Lovecraft's claim to universality as this being a sort of uh, universal terror because I s more suspect that, uh, like I said, horror is more something that is what we find horrendous is something uh, is, is when something is completely negated that we value. What's valued here is, you know, reason, order, and um, I think this sort of, you know, uh, goes with the time that um, in which Lovecraft was writing, and this is a, um, a citation that I, you know, copy pasted at length here because he talks about the sciences. Um, it's actually one of the, one of the <coughs> characters, so it's the beginning of a story called uh, the, the Call of Cthulhu. Uh, I'm saying Cthulhu, I think that's the way to pronounce it, but that's also one of the things in Lovecraft's writing is that this, you know, absolute terror, you, can even, you cannot even properly pronounce the, the, the name, so you know, it goes right into the very uh, possibility of language. So the character says, the most merciful thing in the world <clears throat> is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it wasn't meant that we should voyage so far. The sciences, each training in, in its own direction, have armed us a little, but someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up terrifying vistas of reality that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. So that's you know, an ex, an, uh, a piece of very dark writing for you. And <clears throat> it, uh, it sort of uh, illustrates what I want to, uh, want to show. So the, Im the, the, the impossibility of reason or the, the horrors of total knowledge as well as a sort of uh, uh, opposite to this. Now, um, this is an example of a, um, uh, a novel and and a film by. Uh, the writer Jeff van der Meer. Um, it's a trilogy, and the first book is called Annihilation. And this is a really nice example of what now is considered the new weird, and it's also a form of eco fiction. And uh, the photo here is still of, uh, of, of, of the movie. And you see human forms which at some point unspecified because it's still weird so things are never explained uh, have turned for some mysterious reason into vegetal forms and it is a story about um, uh, an area called area x which seems to live a life of its own it seems to be a some strange sort of ecological niche but no one really knows and you know this this not knowing is extended right up to the end of the book, so you, you'll never know really what it is. But it's a strange kind of area where um, what we might call you know, nature, it, it, it's an ecology that sort of shapes and reacts to, uh, to our dealings with it. But um, the difference is so that are very are interesting, uh, you know, echoes of Lovecraft in, in the way he writes and uh, in, in, in the idea of this uh, you know, strange ecological vision itself. <coughs> but the difference is that there is still a possibility to sort of know this area. People that go into it do not go instantly mad or do not die. Many of them, in the end, do die, but. <laughs> But not after some some kind of uh, um, transformation, and I cannot go into the details of this this uh, this work, which is really rich and really uh, interesting. But my point is that this um, mobilizes this idea of weird and the unknown and the 
the control uh, that we think we should exert on, on things um, it thematizes it in a different way than the old weird so <clears throat> the encounter with, with, the, with this other with the unknown is not radicalized but there's a possibility of interaction but this possibility and that's the interesting thing I think this possibility of interaction requires something of us one of the things that it requires is that we might need to loosen our obsession with control uh, and the alternatives very binary between light and darkness between knowing only part or knowing the whole but knowing the whole might destroy us but there in, in, in Lovecraft there is sort of hints at this possibility of knowing the whole thing even if it, if it will destroy us and this is not really the case as I feel in this sort of uh, literature especially not in this um, in this novel because the um, there's no project of total knowledge and knowledge is not you know a project of either redemption something total knowledge is going to save us or of, or of doom total knowledge is simply not possible because the territory that we're trying to chart territory that we're trying to understand mutates while we are trying to know it and I think with this we're coming very much uh, we're coming much closer to the things that happen for example in uh, in the lab with the model organisms. So what the new weird uh, thematizes and articulates and what Lovecraft stories actively deny is this possibility of encounter and of being in a situation um, without knowing where it will lead. You know, we don't know the fate of uh, where this weird discovering or deciding where it, where it should lead. So if weird is etymologically related to fate, then weird literature works um, works around this idea that trying to know our fate induces twists of fate. <coughs> and in Lovecraft, um, you know, like I said, knowing fate leads to the destruction of, of humanity and the annihilation of reason itself. But that's a theology the uh, 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 teleology in itself because we, we know what all the knowledge will lead to the new, the new weird composes with these you know, twists of fate and tries to you know, stay with them or stay with the trouble uh, in, in, in Haraway's words so final part I'll try to speed up because I'm taking more time than uh, we did start a little late but yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. <coughs> but I, I, I can wrap this up Pretty, pretty quickly so so back to the uh, the slogan keep bio biology weird which was to me a sort of call to attention to uh, um, to pay due attention to what sci certain scientific findings such as in the lab might actually require of us in order to accommodate uh, these these new facts rather than sort of directly projecting or fixed moral and political uh, discussions onto them <coughs> so <clears throat> the weird is to me an interesting mode of attention um, a, th a way of thinking with scientific findings and perhaps uh, a way to to avoid uh, closing discussions out too quickly as you know the scientific facts being data uh, or evidence for something else maybe it's something that could help thinkers in terms of propositions scientific findings as propositions in the sense of uh, whitehead and also mobilized as such by Bruno Latour so propositions um, indicating how the world might further artic articulate so not just an epistemological question but an ontological question of you know if we follow this proposition how might we and the scientific fact, you know, uh, call into existence new kinds of possibilities? How uh, might the world further articulate? So there's no destiny involved here, but only twists and changes while we engage with the world itself. Now, <clears throat> um, to go back to, to, to epigenetics very briefly, my initial 
perplexity with, with epigenetics um, was actually triggered by a, um, a commentary on a research article. Um, the research article showed that, uh, so this is, I give the proper references in the final slide, uh, there, it's a uh, research that was coordinated by Adelaide Soubry, who is a researcher at, at KU Leuven. And the article was about um, paternal obesity in humans, which uh, they showed that this um, paternal obesity was associated with a specific uh, epige epigenetic uh, condition, a methylation. And this was passed on to uh, the children. And they did a study on the newborns where they actually found this very specific epigenetic marker that was you know, associated that is associated with um, uh, obesity of of the father. And in their research, they managed to rule out maternal influences in the in the in, in the gene. So, so that was what the research said. And this was published in BMC Medicine in, in 2013. <coughs> and in the same issue of the scientific journal. Uh, a comment was published on the on the same article. So these were researchers who got to uh, you know read the article before it was published. So a commentary was published along with it, uh, with the title "Fat Dads Must Not Be Blamed for Their Children's Health Problems." Now, there's already a co contradiction to me in the in the in the very title because you know they should not be blamed they should somehow be protected but we still call them fat dads while whereas uh, the original research article never spoke about fat dads and it had no moral content because you know it seemed important to me to look into the details of this, this study and you know the title of the study which is uh, paternal obesity is associated with IGF2 hypomethylation in newborns but it, it reflects the contents of the article there's a statistical association between obese fathers of the study population and the presence of this hypomethylation in newborns. But there are no other inferences made or suggested. Uh, it's a scientific finding that one could probably, if, if one has the, you know, the, the scientific background and competences, that will, one could probably criticize for a variety of reasons, but not for its moral content. Uh, so it's a study that simply shows, look, there's this, you know, relationship that we see now that we didn't suspect before. But the commentators apparently took issue with this, saying that the fat dads should not be blamed. And um, their argument is quite remarkable because they point out a series of issues with the research design and the statistics that they criticize. But then they say this, uh, and I quote, we must not be too hasty to blame either parent for their offspring's health outcomes without being certain that these effects are consequentially robust." End of quote. So the question then becomes, okay, so if we have a better study, is it then okay to start blaming the so-called uh, fat deaths? Is it just a question, in other words, of more facts, of evidence, and then it's okay, then we can, you know, unleash all our you know, moral and political categories and blame them for, uh, you know. And that's what the authors seem to apply. We cannot blame them without being certain. So this is the mindset of a, a police investigator or a judge. And this is not the mindset that I am, sort of the mode of, the mode of attention that I am trying to uh, evoke here with, by referencing to the weird and so on. Um, so it's not a very careful uh, response to these findings, I think. Uh, it's not a response of care. And to me it subordinates newly discovered biological and phylogenetic relations to moral judgments without thinking further how these relations that the article shows might prompt us to think differently actually about kinship, about the ecology of what we term obesity as a condition, uh, how we might need to think differently about responsibility. No, this newly discovered relation becomes a question of judicial, juridical scrutiny. 
And it's no evidence that, uh, sorry, it's no coincidence then that we insist so much in, in these debates on evidence. And that's uh, sort of the, the why I want to pro prob problematize the word evidence and the way we mobilize it. And I contrast it to <coughs> this other mode of attention which stays with, you know, the the, the weirdness, the, the, the fact that, you know, there's a new relation here discovered and how should we think about this? What does it actually mean? But, you know, the question of responsibility and causes turns up again and again. And epigenetics is full of these kind of uh, controversies. So I think that in this case, uh, you know, keep biology weird might be an, appro an appropriate uh, thing to say. Don't decide beforehand on the, the fate of the discussion that, is, uh, that we are going to have here and on the, on the fate of the persons who are actually involved uh, in the study. And <clears throat> I think this is perhaps important, especially today in uh, times in which biology, the life sciences, ecology in particular, uh, are very much present and important in the production of signs and indexes and symptoms through which we try to understand uh, the world that surrounds us in terms of chemical pollution with biomonitoring for example in terms of epigenetics uh, with respect to health and disease so uh, that's well that's the point that I uh, wanted to make through this excursion through the through the weird um, which I try to elaborate a bit more for for this talk and uh, I don't know if I should consider you the happy recipients <laughs> of these reflections or the unfortunate <laughs> victims of a, <laughs> a confusing uh, intervention, but uh, uh, I look forward to discussing this with you. And thank you again for inviting me and giving me the <laughs>
questions. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah, of course. Um, when you were talking about uh, observing the weird, about the, about the, uh, what's the name? The, Huanda, Huanda, it's elegance. How about the elegance? C elegance. Say C, just say C, yeah. It's C elegance for friends. <laughs> <It's> C elegance for <laughs> the world. You, you argue well that the standardization is important because you see better the phenomenon. But in what? But at, at, but you were defending a notion of weird that is not just epistemological. Mm -hmm. So could you could you elaborate a little bit between the aspect epistemological, like the standardization is a technique to see, and the standardization is also a technique to produce mm -hmm. the weird, the, the, the new phenomenon, the new biology mm -hmm. phenomenon that maybe the sea elegance in nature. Do not show at all that kind of uh, special comportment uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. the, um, but the 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 the, um, the worm as a model is it, as a model organism is actually. <coughs> I like to see it as sort of um, ontological bifurcation between the the worm that lives in the wild and the one that's going to be domesticated in the lab, laboratory because the domestication itself changes <coughs> the, the worm. It, 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 it changes, um, it's being kept stable, what, what doesn't happen in, in, in nature. It's probably much more complex because the, uh, uh, like I said, the, 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 for, exam for example, the gut mi microbiome is actually what they call bleached, so it's washed out uh, by chemical means. So the the it's still an org it, it, it's a, an organism, but it is a laboratory organism. It changes. It's not the same organism as in the. Uh, and this is all being done to keep to be able to keep certain parameters stable, <coughs> which are in all so, sorts of wild conversations and. In nature, on your compost heap, for example, because that's where they they live on rotten fruit, and uh, that's a sort of their natural habitat. Um, it's impossible to work with a so-called wild worm. They call them wild uh, worms, uh, wild types. These wild types, it's impossible to work with them. You, you cannot isolate variables because they can come from within, from from the microbiome, from its what is feeding on and so on and so forth. So it, it, a new organism in a sense is, is created uh, to keep as much param parameters stable as possible. And <clears throat> you, could crit you could criticize this and say, okay, so you're making an artificial animal, uh, but it's, uh, it has the advantage of uh, showing us things that we simply wouldn't be able to observe if we took uh, a worm from any uh, uh, compost heap. And so that's why I said that, um, um, yeah, that, that this enables us to, to, to standardization makes this possible. And I also want to distinguish um, <clears throat> the weird as I try to you know, mobilize it here or think along with it here as something simple that would simply be uh, another name for uh, something we don't know yet. Uh, rather, it's something that happens, and it's not only on our part, <coughs> on the you know the the knowing scientist part. The um, the worm itself is it's not because it's being we're trying to keep it stable in a different environment that it's not that the worm is not continuing a sort of course. In, in its own existence and we interfere with it and this of course alters the course of, of the worm but um, the worm still reacts uh, or does things <coughs> along its developmental pathway that we didn't expect such as changing its genome along the way while the whole infrastructure is really there to keep that genome uh, stable and what I like about you know the biologists that I work with, and I think this this is what many characterize many biologists. They think this is funny, and they really like it. So.
so this is what keeps them going because the, the unexpected things keep on happening. So, uh, but you let, let me push you a little bit. No. You're from STS, so so you're probably going to me in or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if if a scientist claim we have discovered some physiological blah 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 in this form, and they can they claim they discover something about wildlife, or should they say they create something? Mm -hmm. That is interesting, <coughs> that is in, in the domain of biology, but mm -hmm. it's not some about life on Earth. Mm -hmm. It's about what we built in the lab, in the So it's, it's not artificial, but it's a little bit engineering. Yes, it is. It is. But as far as I know, they're not concerned with what the worms do, specific worms in nature. What they're interested in is discovering certain uh, mechanisms understand how for example uh, uh, say uh, uh, a methylation of a protein complex is being passed on to the next generation but, but they hope that this methylation exists not just in this world in this laboratory it, yeah but of course yeah how but they, they don't make claims about the wild uh, no but how they know I really if, if, it, if it's if it's really weird, it's really and weird is a creation. It's not just a kind of a kind of a, a, a vision, a kind of a epistemological. You claim it's ontological. It's, mm -hmm. it's very little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so you should you should be careful to say at least you need more proof to say that even a mechanism, a biomolecular mechanism you discovered there mm -hmm. exists outside the laboratory. You hope for, I suppose. Yeah, but then again, they're not claiming that. They're not saying, so this is what we discovered and it exists outside of the laboratory. So they only said, say, this is a possibility, this is what, okay. happen this okay. what happened in our in research. Okay, so yeah. they only claim things about the world. But it does inspire other biologists who are also working with other mo model organisms to try and see if they see similar things. See similar. And then gradually there, there are similar patterns, but sometimes there are important differences as well, because sometimes uh, we might think that um, discovery in C. elegans uh, will be the same in fruit flies, and some biologists will insist on, no, no fruit flies is something completely different. And, but that's also the beauty of it, because there's um, to to the scientists working with these model organisms. They, these these are really unique, but they're constantly. In, I agree that they are in between uh, the, the uniqueness of this uh, organism and the hope that some somehow uh, the mechanism they discovered within the organism will uh, sort of. Um, that similar things will be discovered elsewhere, and then they, they will be enthusiastic about that as well. But um, I haven't co come across a research paper where they say so. This teaches us something about the worms in the wild, and actually, the worms in the wild are there's not so much uh, research. research on on that on the natural history of of this. So that's a bit of a, an irony that the worm. In laboratory conditions, we know the connectome, the genome, the, uh, can drop all the parts of it, even if we don't understand all the interactions. But the, the natural history of the, the, the worm itself is not, not very well known. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> super cool, I could, I could say a lot, um, and maybe you will. And <laughs> and it's beer lit. So, um, but for now, let me <coughs> just try, I mean, because this relates to something that, that Alex Honor mentioned, but I just wanted to, to ask it directly. So when you said, uh, the point of the talk when you said that you heard the biologist talking about something being weird, I expected it to go a different way, and I just wonder how it relates to your picture of weirdness. Okay. Because there's also the idea that weird is the discovery moment. Right, weird is the driver. Weird is the kind of weird is this 
Weird's a positive thing, too, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not just that they're weird, but it's that when you see something weird, mm -hmm. when they look at the, when, when you get dendritic structures in the gut of a, one of a worm, you go, oh, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the good weird. So how, how does that, how does this kind of, how, how does that, that kind of weird as, like weird as motor factor in? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's the, that's the reason I think why the, I was interested when they said, oh, that's weird, <coughs> because they like, uh, you know, weird and they like surprise, su surprises and things like that, uh, unexpected things happening. Um, some biologists also talk of you know sense of wonder and really philosophical sense sense of wonder about you know what life is capable of and seeing that happen on a molecular scale in organisms. Um, I was just interested in in in, in seeing okay uh, connecting the word weird with its you know its historical its narrative heritage mm -hmm. uh, and see what we get from that and try to make, perhaps make a distinction between weird and a uh, sense of wonder or weird and, weird and a mere surprise or something. Sure. Uh, yeah, that is true. It's interesting, it's interesting that, they, that they use weird on purpose, right? Uh -huh. that, that they could just say, they could just say that they didn't expect something. But they yeah. usually in the lab, they usually say that it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't think they are saying that with, you know, uh, uh, thinking about the whole et etymological <laughs> heritage of the term, but maybe it's not entirely coincidental either. Cool. That's the sort of wager that I, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, the, 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 the whole thing, um, perhaps here, uh, and, and the, the reason to sort of you know, try to be more precise on this term weird is perhaps also to sort of try to cultivate it as a uh, uh, mode of attention and uh, when I've discussed you know f um, what one of the uh, one of the articles the first, first article that I mentioned here um, with some other people I didn't insist so much upon this uh, heritage of the weird I said, yeah, it's, you're, you're right, it's very interesting what you're saying, but, uh, you know, it's weird, just not another word for a surprise, or, uh, because weird is, you should take into account, you know, the, the, the history of this, this word, and so I was also prompted by colleagues to, to stick through this uh, a, a bit more. Yeah. I saw someone, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I want to go back to the idea of standardization and of the standard standardization, yeah. Because uh, I have a notion that um, for the idea of standardization, you know, the biggest thing is to have a standardized table over time, right? And it asks for a lot of control of the lab for the worms already. So when you scale up to the human stuff and to the problematic of uh, your obesity stuff and all these uh, mm -hmm. healthcare issues for humans, how does it change? Because I would expect that the standard is harder to, to get because if you're speaking, you can just take a human, human and bleach it. And, uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it would be typically quite, quite uh, an issue, right? Uh, but um, <coughs> at some point, I guess, I guess it depends on the time scale of your studies, but if you look for, for example, for obesity, uh, the far longer in time, far it seems to be like a, a standard feature that we expect out of human because of the, the rate of uh, the rate of uh, obese people about to, to uh, Normal people in the kitchen, if you go to exclusion mark, is increasing. So, at which point does it become the standard? Does it become not good anymore? Is it related to the, the I guess, the rate of the idea of how you set up the standard for human rights? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of an issue of uh, the stability of civilization in human rights. So, you mean, uh, do you mean how, how, how do they define uh, obesity? That is a, <coughs> a good question. That uh, there's a lot of uh, STS work on, on classifications of conditions and are they diseases or not. And um, yeah, sure. And then st standardizing human beings like worms is uh, impossible. That's why they use model organisms and not humans. Uh. <laughs> but there are attempts at 
some sort of standardization if you want to see the, I, I think, the, 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 the site where standards, uh, attempted standardization is at, 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 at its strongest in humans is in clinical trials probably. Uh, just uh, drugs, but then again, like I said, I did work a bit on uh, uh, clinical trials and trying to prove the benefits of food, which are not drugs. So the effects cannot be, uh, you know, effects of um, curing or preventing disease. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, this this is uh, a lot uh, a lot more difficult because you're not administering one simple molecule. Well, it's not simple, but one potent agent, one molecule. But people are you know eating all the time, and the the thing that they're trying to test, say calcium or so, or uh, uh, blood sterile or something, might be present in a lot of things that people eat, so they try to uh, standardize their diets, they usually exclude vegetarians, and there's all sorts of things that happen uh, when uh, people are enrolled in these kind of uh, clinical trials. And as for food, they uh, actually tinkered with the definition of obesity, because as food cannot prove it's it's, it's a forbidden by law to, to uh, make medicinal claims on food and in clinical trials you cannot use obese uh, subjects and prove that it, because if you prove that your uh, food somehow works in whatever way then officially your food is no longer food but medicine mm. so for the whole thing to be kept food to keep it food People need to be kept normal, and, but you know, how do you prove that normal people become healthier? So no, but they are not really normal, they're sort of sub, in a suboptimal health state, a sort of new category that's called into, into being. And then for obesity, for example, it would be people between a body mass of uh, 25 and 35, I think. So there's all sorts of classification work, active work going on there. Uh, Yeah, but average human that doesn't work because yeah. it might be a local standard, but uh, you have to take into uh, account also the <coughs> uh, you know social and political conditions in which people live, and obesity is uh, far more prevalent in uh, situations of poverty than in others. So. Uh, I think you can make averages, you can always make averages with statistics, but you need to take into account the <coughs> social political background uh, uh, as well. So, uh, and that's another reason to rethink this, you know, to, to see, consider obesity not just as a specific <coughs> uh, condition or disease, it's a really reflects a, uh, uh, an ecology in a sense made of social and political factors and access to uh, food and habits and, and, and all sorts of things. But we like to, especially in, um, you know, uh, political projects, uh, public health projects, we like to try to draw, draw distinctions between uh, people who are really have a real disease and people who have a sort of behavioral problem. We like to use the term behavior. Uh, because it's easier to try and uh, make recommendations for better behavior for people than to change the social and political conditions uh, which define you know, their livelihood. But so the standard is going to define normatively uh, the transcendental way is defined from uh, what is descriptively the case and abstract from it is defined in the abstract manner, right? Philosophically, because I mean, if over time, like uh, ninety percent of the population has access, has become the, uh, in a certain way, mm -hmm. can you still remain can keep the older standard, like, uh, the older standard of uh, 
So what you're asking is how the standards evolve yes. if the, the, the reality they yeah. attempt to describe evolves as well. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I expect that even if 90% of the population is obese, it will still be normatively uh, an issue. Uh, right? mm -hmm. I think that depends on from one case to another. Uh, <coughs> I mean, there are politicians who have uh, lowered unemployment rates by changing the, 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 <laughs> the, the definition of what unemployment is. So. They've lower, lowered them, and the same happens. That's that's the magic of statistics. So, <laughs> yeah. but, you, but you still must believe that there's if there's some causal factor, <coughs> it's not just a condition. If there's a causal factor that you put mm -hmm. that you you show through this normalization, cannot be just a convention. Maybe maybe not. Yeah, but again, still you know. So if you do the same experiment, maternity obesity, and it's impossible not to have that that are not obese in your sample, because that's the standard of that population, would you be able to show the ADA effect, even if it exists? Your question, <laughs> <laughs> another question. Uh, first one of clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I, I think I, I must have missed something because I didn't really see how the what you said about the the, the fat dads, let's say. Um, what the relation is with, with with the whole weirdness thing? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's a case clearly where people are too quick in uh, jumping to moral conclusions or. Uh, blaming others for uh, uh, inferring moral stuff where it's not. Uh, I, mean, I think there's there's also kind of wrong inference going on uh, in in this paper and the comment and so on. But what does that have to do with weirdness? It's not the weirdness that is being uh, 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 morally despised or something uh, or, or or rejected. It's 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 a certain. Uh, Behavior in, in society that is not weird at all because uh, certainly in US society obesity is like is quite common. So so I, I didn't see the, the link with mm -hmm. the rest of, uh, the, of of the talk. I mm -hmm. guess. The the what I call here the weirdness is um, the, the the fact that a, a new relation has been discovered in molecular terms mm -hmm. so this um, let's say that this points to the fact that um, something can be transmitted which previously we perhaps w we didn't think possible something something is, is being transmitted uh, in this case a uh, uh, hypomethylation um, and this might not be weird in itself, but um, I think it's important to try and stay with um, these specific uh, findings and allow for some discomfort, perhaps, uh, around, uh, okay, let's think a bit further. So this indicates a new kind of relation. Um, it has uh, some implications also for you know kinship relations which also seem to extend um, um, through through pathways that we didn't previously uh, consider um, and so this is what I this is also what they saw with the with, with the worm in, in, in a certain sense it was also about uh, father worm uh, transmitting something to the to the to the uh, offspring and the effects that that that, that has and <clears throat> in the more general sense um, what I'm trying to get at is that um, is to avoid um, the, you know the the, the yeah this trap like you said of, of uh, uh, moralization and the the uh, 
not accommodating, you know, the, the concepts that we have in the face of something that, you know, invites us to rethink uh, the, the nature of, of that which we are investigating, namely, you know, people and their relations through molecular uh, mechanisms. Uh, I, I think that if you cannot see the weirdness, uh, in a sense, of this, um, then have you really understood the implications? Have you really understood what, what's 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 happening in the in the in the research? I see. And uh, my main question actually uh, is, is is more philosophical. Uh, so I'm, um, <clears throat> I I would like to understand whether the sort of weirdness you're interested in uh, has to do more with um, this descriptive aspect, uh, scientific aspect, uh, like pure science aspect, or more technology aspect. Like there's this, of course, like monster Frankenstein and so on, this sort of uh, uh, monsters, weird things uh, that you can, like, evil or good biologists uh, could create it and, and, and this is a model uh, uh, organism that is kind of boring I mean in, in itself it's not like a monster Frankenstein monster it's um, uh, a, 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 but, but while uh, trying to make it standard while trying to make it as boring as possible like nature is always annoying uh, like then, and then you then, then the weirdest things show up, mm -hmm. but not because anybody was trying to construct uh, a monster. Quite the opposite, uh, they were trying to control, <laughs> have control, they were trying to study it as if it was uh, something of which the fate could be predicted. Mm -hmm. to, to yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, and then, because of this standardization and so on, it seems that actually it becomes easier to discover the monster. Uh, mm -hmm. This goes completely in different direction than saying, oh, actually, maybe it's interesting in, in science to sometimes let uh, evil geniuses or geniuses in general uh, 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 go wild and, 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 and build stuff that normally shouldn't happen in a certain survival in, in nature and uh, doesn't correspond to any of the standards we have. But uh, use your imagination and 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 uh, try to I don't know uh, have have combined two organisms into one or whatever. Uh, I don't know anything about biology. Uh, but 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 uh, not going for standardization, not going for uh, um, uh, trying to be a predictable subject, but create something new, something biological, mm -hmm. but but technological, new in the lab. That is unpredictable, uh, and, and it will no, nothing will be a big surprise because anyway, you there is no uh, um, <coughs> you did something new. So so what is coming out will anyway not uh, 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 be according to your expectations because there were basically none, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, and this might also be something that is sometimes good to 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 try out the weird stuff. But the strategy towards the two kinds of weirds seems very different, quite opposite, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so that's so why I was wondering whether you see this tension or whether what, what you were trying actually to get into, get at, and whether it's mm -hmm. two maybe two sides of the same uh, attractive uh, attitude. I don't know. Or not, so, so, so yeah, it's quite an open question. This sort of completely wild creating without expectation, that I don't think this happens anywhere. No, no, maybe I present uh, it a little bit too, too it's, wild. It's a very <laughs> theoretical uh, yeah, yeah, uh, action. <laughs> <laughs> but there are uh, creations of, you know, that come closer to, to you know the Frankenstein option where there are expectations and these this happens uh, in, in biotech labs I, I think yeah. where we make for, for example transgenic plants which resist pesticides and then they are you know uh, 
used and they encourage the increasing use of pesticides and then the consequences of all that. We have, we're only starting to, uh, to understand those. Um, but that is a solutionist um, technological enterprise um, where there is no, I don't think there's any room for, for weird uh, in this sense. It's just trying to, uh, you have a solution, you're creating, a, you have a solution in mind and which redefines the problem of, uh, of uh, poor harvest in the south, for example, as a technical problem, it's a techno fix. Um, and, you know, it either it works or it doesn't. Um, I think that in, you know, fundamental research there is a technological component as well if in, in the, the whole process to standardize uh, the organism there's a, a lot of you know technical um, uh, procedures that are being followed but it's not the creation of a new technology because it's driven by a specific uh, specific uh, hypothesis and, 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 and questions and it's in the in in that context that you can actually be, be uh, surprised by the way your boring organism uh, shows itself not to be boring at all and um, there's one thing that I uh, started to you know understand while working with these uh, biologists that they are really fascinated by this uh, by this worm despite the fact that we know its genome and its connectome uh, for a couple of decades now, uh, so um, so yeah, so that I think that's a <coughs> uh, difference to make. Um, the, the you know the creation of a, of a technological solution to something, or the um, the research that's happening in this kind of of, uh, of laboratory. Um, you want to? Sea yeah. elegans is one among many yeah. others modern organisms that biologists could, could, could choose. And there was a very nice paper by Philosopher of Science uh, quite recently, and there, uh, which was entitled How to Choose Your Research Organism. Okay. Ah. And then they listed uh, what, what criteria the scientists use when they want to choose a research organism. You can choose like a worm, a rat, a monkey, and so on. And uh, for instance, like cost obviously is uh, is has to be considered. So to the easiness to grow in laboratory, your, your model in, in, in your organism in the lab, uh, so very practical thing, but also very more epistemic thing. So how does it um, uh, relate? How does the, model, the organism specifically relate to the phenomenon of interest? So for instance, how, how does it how close is it to, for instance, the human species? Because obviously this is. In the end, what we are most interested in when we are studying cancer, we don't want to 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 cure rat to 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 cure rat rat colon and cancer. To, to, to. So you have a lot of uh, considerations. But then you can use uh, then you can say okay, take the rodent because it's more it's mammal, but then it's too expensive to grow. Uh, so then weirdness. What would be the role of weirdness? Uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a factor in this uh, kind of choice among models. I, mean, is it, I, I see two directions. Maybe if uh, is, isn't just like we, weirdness is a um, kind of strategy to save a model from boredom, would you say? Maybe it's a, like, see, a worm is quite uh, far from human spaces. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, uh, so there's a lot of disadvantages in terms of maybe if we, if we want to go to clinical applications. And models have a life, you know, they, 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 have a, they have a life cycle. At some point, everyone does flies, and then <laughs> no one does anymore. And the one is a way. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, so <coughs> your researchers, so the point was in, was in put real as for a while. Do they see? Maybe for them it's a strategy to just save a model that is going to disappear from boredom? <laughs> or is it... Um, or do you see the risk when we say that, oh, if 
it's too weird, maybe there is also the risk that it's not useful anymore because if it's too weird, it means that it's too far away from what we understand, or from, from what we are interested in in other parts of science, or from the form in human being. Um, so how would you researchers, as we call weird, let's speak, um, um, relate to other kind of models? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I cannot speak in their name, of course, but I did organize a seminar um, at the end of my research day where I presented a, a talk which partly um, resembled a bit this talk. And um, there was a discussion and they were, they were uh, uh, very appreciative of the, you know, of, of the talk and all and there was all this discussion going on in which they more or less all confess that of in fact uh, they're not interested in humans at all and if they could stay away from humans as far as possible that would be great because the world is really what they're interested in and it's, uh, I mean uh, af after several months and then after, after that I, I remain stayed in touch through through email uh, I sent them the paper for EMBO reports as well um, um, at, at some point, re uh, even inviting them to, to co-author it if, if, if they liked. Um, but it is, this didn't happen f for reasons of timing and so on. But um, uh, the only uh, thing that I can conclude so far from all the discussions that I had and the reactions on this particular paper and this particular idea of the weird is that they, you know, they, they, they fully support it and they it's as simple as that, they are, they're interested in the worm because it's, uh, you know, what. the more they work with it, the more they appreciate its unique qualities and how it listen, makes them think differently about uh, certain biological mechanisms without necessarily assuming that these mechanisms will operate in the same way somewhere else. So sometimes even knowing that it doesn't work the same way in the fruit fly, so that becomes an interesting thing in itself. Oh look, I thought this would be would be the same thing as like in fruit flies, but no, it's not the same thing at all. That's weird. Why is this so? And so it has to be the model of something. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's a badly chosen. And I'm not sure that if, if, uh, t if in all cases the term model is still appropriate. And there are um, uh, biologists also who say, well, actually a more appropriate name is experimental organism. It's an experimental organism, an organism to experiment with. It's not necessarily a model. Uh, and in many cases when I asked, you know, well, what is it a model of? And it's not necessarily a model. It shouldn't be a model. So that was their, their answer. It's fair. It's a fair answer, I think. It's an experimental organism. And uh, they have the same kind of fascination. Um, one, one of the, the researchers compared it to, you know, especially the, the photos with the, uh, you know, green fluorescent protein, which allows them to see certain things in more detail, uh, the neural, neuronal markers. Um, they say, well, if, to me, this is like... Uh, looking into deep space and, you know, uh, seeing territories that we didn't know before. They, they you know, they had a real excitement. Uh, and maybe, maybe the, the comparison <coughs> is, is, is valid. I mean, I haven't worked with astrophysicists or, uh, or astronomers, but, uh, you know, maybe the fascination what drives them is something very similar. Possibility for a genuine encounter, encountering something, you know, uh, genuine encounter with the real, even if it has to go through a lot of artifice, which makes the encounter possible in the first place. So, uh, yeah. I can't talk about the astrophysicist, but <coughs> when you do a history, for instance, you do have that. A what? History. Okay. Find some archive and you're like, wow, that's crazy. Nobody has seen this before. They did in the past, but <coughs> now I'm the only one seeing this right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I've done something similar. 
and you also have the oh this is weird <laughs> maybe I'm missing some archives to make sense of it like in a bad sense this is weird in a bad sense but it makes also weird in a good sense so otherwise we also need to look There's at biologists uh, we can also look at historians <laughs> he's also doing history do you do? Oh yeah, this one. That's interesting, though, that you say. Oh, good. It sort of echoes what what you said a bit earlier on. That maybe a good and a bad weird. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> because also, in, I don't know. It's same as in history, where right? maybe you misread. Like you know, when it's handwritten archive, maybe you misread something. But in science, you can also mess up. And so that's where it can mean, oh, we messed up the test, we messed up the lab, we messed up something. Probably it happens a lot. No yeah, sure. it happens all the time. I'm not just this and that. Yeah. Um, you know, you can back with the COVID-19 positive test and then a negative, and that's weird. And the, they're like, is this just, you know, bad luck or is it a mistake in the lab, like you have to consider both. But the rule we should all adopt, avoid cosmic horror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it cannot be reasoned to have to do any science. <laughs> That's the rule number one. <laughs> <laughs> that you want it for your, for your choice or not. But it's great literature, isn't it? They're, they're good stories. <laughs> Definitely time, so yeah. let's uh, thank you. Thank you.